Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to your house this morning very aware of your power in all things, your sacrifice for us, and the expanse of your grace. It is good to be in your house and to fellowship with you and with one another. We welcome you to this meeting with grateful hearts to worship you. Lord, open our ears. Make us consciously aware of your Holy Spirit with us. Make us sensitive to all that you have for us today. In your holy name, amen. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand and pass the peace to one another in the joy of the resurrection? Tammy mentioned this last week, uh, a lot of the songs that we sing every Sunday morning are pulled from scripture, the, the themes, the story, sometimes the actual words. And so this first song that we're going to sing together, uh, Psalm 100, we've already engaged in with our call to worship being from Psalm 100. And there's um, a few portions, two portions will, uh, that will just say one, and so Daniel will lead us in that, and then uh, there will be sections that will say all, and we'll join our voices together. And while this text, I'm sure, is going to be very familiar. The melody, the tune might be a little bit newer. And so uh, if you don't know it right away or aren't catching on right away, go ahead and just enjoy the words. And then as the melody becomes more familiar, please join your voices in with us. Let's worship the Lord with gladness together. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the Into 
Springs of Freedom, and it's a very intentional prayer ministry that seeks to help people find freedom through hope and restoration through the power of Jesus Christ. And they specifically focus on wounds that you may have experienced in your past that's affecting the way that you are viewing God, viewing self, or viewing others. And David, David Kelly, right there. Uh, he's the he's on staff with Wellsprings, but he's also a member at College Wesleyan. Uh, the first time he kind of explained this to our staff was, he said, where there's garbage, the rats will come. And so one of the things that I've been to a couple sessions, and one of the biggest takeaways for me has been kind of a new way to pray. So you're in a very intentional prayer time, and the facilitator um, from time to time will ask something like, what is the enemy saying to you? What lie is the enemy speaking to you? And I would respond with something like, um, that I have to earn love. And then the facilitator would say, but what is the truth that God is speaking to you? And it's in those sessions, in that moment, it never failed that the voice of God would radiate through my body, either through scripture or song lyrics, or maybe the words that friends or families had spoken to me in the past. And I would say, you are my beloved and I am yours. I am abounding in steadfast love. You are chosen, not forsaken. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So many times we operate out of the lies that we believe about ourselves, lies from the enemy. We operate out of those instead of the identity that we have in Christ. And so as we continue singing together, um, this next song, in my opinion, is kind of written in a wellspring's prayer session uh, style. So we'll proclaim things that aren't true, uh, like hate and fear and shame, things that warp our view of God and self and others. But then we'll sing the truth together, that Cristo reina, Christ reigns, Jesus reigns. So let's lift our voices together in prayer. Be gone, fear be gone. It 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come this morning in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We know you are with us. We are thankful for your mercy and grace, all that we have, and for answered prayer. We know that you hear and that you care. We pray this morning for the needs of your people. We remember those who cannot be with us this morning. Touch them emotionally and spiritually. Encourage and uplift them. We remember the requests and praises of those who have physical needs and problems. We think especially of Judy Showalter this morning and her needs. Be with her. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We remember Gladys Burns and family as they mourn the loss of her brother. Remind them of your presence, your care for them, and the hope of heaven. Meet their needs and give assurance that you are answering our prayers. We remember the local and global partners that we support both here and around the world. Meet their needs, multiply their efforts. We pray for our church and the many decisions and plans being made. Give us divine wisdom and direction. We pray for our community, our government, and those who rule over us. We ask for a revival of godliness, righteousness, and holiness in our country. We pray for your word preached to us today and for the pastor as he preaches it. Give your divine anointing on him and the words he speaks, and give us all open and obedient hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from the prophet Haggai and the Peter's first epistle. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. <laughs> then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruin? Look what's happening to you. You've planted much but harvested little. You eat but are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you can't keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Look what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills and bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I'll take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. Does the remnant of God's people remember his house, the temple, in its former splendor? How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now the Lord says, be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. In just a little while, I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord. And in this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you'll grow into a full experience of salvation. 
cry out for this nourishment. Now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you talk with most people in just about any culture in the world, they'll tell you that they were taught from a pretty young age that lying is wrong. It's just sort of a core part of the universal human experience. We don't like to be hoodwinked. We don't like the wool pulled over our eyes. We want to know that people are telling us how things really are. And Christians sort of, we don't have the market cornered on this, but we tend to be really careful about truth telling. Early and often in Sunday schools, we're taught about the importance of telling the truth. Christians look throughout scripture and we look throughout Christian history and we tend to sort of prize or esteem or look up to people who tell the truth even at great personal cost. But as good as Christians are at telling the truth to others, we're actually uh, pretty good at lying to ourselves. I realized this a few years ago um, when I was early on in my employment at College Church and I was primarily working with college students and I would meet with, co- with dozens of college students every year over coffee and hear the same thing in different words. And one time I heard the message so clearly that I wrote it down. This is the message that I would hear over the years from hundreds of college students each year from dozens of them. After college... I'll finally be the kind of person I want to be. I won't have to do school. I'll have so much free time. My relationship with God will be easier. I'll find a way to give back to the community. I'll get to know my neighbors. I'll read for fun. I'll have tons of spare money. I heard this over and over and over. One guy said, literally, there's a time coming after college and it's not too far away when I'll have more time to do the stuff that I really care about. And so I caught up with this guy about three years after graduation, told him what he had said a few years ago and said, how's that working for you? And then I wrote down what he said. He said, I have two jobs not enough money, I'm struggling to attend church, I found zero ways to serve the community, I don't know my neighbors, and making friends as an adult is weird. (laughs) Amen. And then he said, but soon, when I'm a little older, and my life gets more simple, I'll finally get around to doing the stuff that I really want to do. Before I hung up the phone, I told him that he could teach a master class on self-deception. But then when I hung up, I realized that I've told myself a lot of those kind of stories too. And I would imagine you have as well. I mean, haven't you thought at some point or another, someday I'm going to make a plan for really intentionally parenting our kids. Someday I'm going to join a community that helps me break out of this addiction Someday, I'm going to incorporate some sort of meaningful practice of prayer into my life. Someday, I'm going to find a place when I have a little spare time to use my time as a blessing to others. Someday, I'm going to do all that stuff, but there's just no way that I'm going to have the time right now. I'm realizing as I work with more ages that this isn't just a young adult thing. You know, and I know people in middle age and retirement age and on their deathbed who find that their life has fallen into the gap between the things that they say they value and the things that their days have actually accomplished. 
I talked with one older person last year who was nearing the end of her life, and she said, there are so many things that I said I was going to do someday, and I'm realizing only now that it's too late that there aren't that many some days left. And so these days I've been wondering, what is the call of God to those of us who live in the gap between the things that we say we care about and the priorities that we live out every day. That's where the prophet Haggai comes in. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets keep warning God's people about the difference between what they say they value, they say they value their covenant with God, and the things that they actually value. They're taking advantage of their neighbors, they're worshiping other gods, and the prophets keep speaking into these people who are caught in this gap, saying that if we don't keep our covenant, if we don't return to God, we're going to be destroyed. And then finally it happens. In 586 BC, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. God's people were dominated by Babylon, were carried off to exile in the Babylonian empire. And so during exile, the prophets continue, because it's their job to do so, to paint an alternative picture of the way things can be. They say someday God's going to bring back a remnant of those people who are in exile and build a new Jerusalem. And all that leads to Haggai. It's been about 70 years since the temple was destroyed, and the Babylonian empire that forced the Jews into exile has just collapsed. The Persians have taken over, and they allowed the Jews to return to their homeland and restore the city of Jerusalem. And this feels like really great news, right? The thing that the prophets said might happen can happen. And they can rebuild the temple, which was thought to be the place where heaven and earth overlap. This is amazing. But if you've done a construction project recently, you know that things can often take a lot longer than you budget for. And so after a short time, the construction project ran into snags and the building project was shut down. And by the time the project was set to begin again, God's people had moved on to other stuff. They're combing through rubble to rebuild their houses. They're trying to farm land that they haven't been able to even visit in decades. They're recovering from the financial impact of having to reacclimate to an entirely new region. And so when they walk by the ruins of the temple, it gnaws at them because they think someday we need to get that thing done. But there's no way that I can pull off one more project right now. And then droughts come and the crops fail and they think there's just one more reason why this isn't a good idea. We have no time, we have no money, we have no energy to spare. The time hasn't come to build the Lord's house when I can barely survive in mine. And just like us, a group of sincerely devout religious people are caught in the gap between the life that they say they want and the priorities that their days are showing. And so God speaks through Haggai, and here's what the text reads, starting in verse 2. It says, These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. And the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, saying, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways, You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, you never have your fill. You put on clothes, you're not warm. You earn wages, but you put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains, bring down timber, and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little because what you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which is a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. And so I read this a few weeks ago, and I thought, this just seems kind of harsh, especially to a group of people who sincerely desire to be godly. These are people who move their whole lives across an empire to build God's house. They're full of deep religious conviction. They feel a twinge of shame every time they think about their unfulfilled commitments to God. They feel a genuine desire to do the right thing. These are decent people just like us. 
But somewhere along the line, they drifted from pursuing God's mission to pursuing their own mission using godly principles. They're not doing bad things. I mean, the text doesn't say they're doing anything in particular that's evil. They're just so focused on doing the urgent things in their own lives, taking care of their needs and just a few of their wants, putting food on the table, saving a little money, that they miss the things that God is inviting them to. Sounds like us. What Haggai is inviting the people to do is to make the turn from conviction to repentance. Conviction is God's spirit pressing on your conscience to make you aware of where you've missed the mark. But repentance is walking with the spirit as God turns you around to a new way of living. Conviction is God's spirit pressing on your conscience to make you aware of where you've missed the mark. Repentance is walking with the spirit as God turns you around to a new way of living. If I was to say it a little sim more simply, the turn from conviction to repentance is a turn from being made sorry to being made new. In Haggai's audience, that meant turning around to build the temple, right? There's a clear sort of artifact of obedience or disobedience. There's either a ruin or there's a temple, right? Or something in between that indicates progressive obedience. So in their day, what obedience looked like was clear. But what I've wondered as I've read through Haggai and as we're in this series on the minor prophets, what I've wondered is what in the world does it mean for us to sort of listen to Haggai's message and obey? What are we building? In the Old Testament, the temple is a place of overlap between heaven and earth. But in the New Testament, that overlap is relocated, not in a temple, but in the person of Jesus Christ. And then by the Holy Spirit, through the person of Jesus Christ to the church, who are, as First Peter, which you heard read earlier, said, built together into a dwelling place for the Spirit so that we can live as Jesus lived. In other words, we're not building a structure. We're not building a temple. What we're building is a truly loving life. That's what we're building. A life where, in Peter's words, we give up approaching each other through the lens of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy, where our power, where our money, where our time, our attention, and our resources are used not just for ourselves, but for the benefit of others. And so, churches, I've thought about this message, and I've thought about the conversations that I've had in your living rooms and coffee shops over the past several years, I've wondered what it would mean for us to make the turn from wanting this kind of life to living this kind of life. I think if we're honest, there are probably all sorts of things that you and I have been probably convicted about for months. Some of us have been called to do prison ministry. Some of us have been called to do global ministry. Some of, have, of, of us have been called to serve at a hospital or the rescue mission in Grant County. Others of us have felt convicted to get to know our neighbors or make amends with people that we've hurt long ago. Still others of us are feeling convicted to start going to counseling so we can face some of the things that have made us unavailable to others for years because we've gotten self-absorbed, not because we mean to be, but because we're always caught up in our own pain in a way that leaks onto others. We think, I mean, I need to get to that someday. Someday when my life is easier and I have time, I'll do it. If I can be so bold as to just pretend to be Haggai for about 30 seconds... I'd say that there's never going to be a better time than today to stop living in conviction and start living in repentance. This is the day when you can stop being sorry and start being better. The timing will never be perfect, but the timing right now is probably about as right as it will ever be to close the gap between the life that you're living and the life that God's called you to live. 
And here's a fun surprise. That kind of life is actually really good for us. You probably caught it in the reading earlier the first time. I didn't, but you tend to be a brighter bunch than me. But Haggai is citing all the difficulties that the people have had. He says they earn wages and they put them into a purse with holes in it, which is not a great saving strategy for those of you building your 401k. They eat, but they never have their fill. They plant a lot, but they harvest only a little. And Haggai said that part of this is because God hasn't allowed his people to prosper because they've been so focused on themselves. But as you know, and I know, some of this was probably just the natural emptiness that we feel when we spend our life on us. The kind of life Haggai is inviting people to in the Old Testament, the kind of life Peter is inviting people to in the New Testament is a fuller life with a broader set of priorities, a character that will age well on earth precisely because it'll age even better into heaven. It's the kind of life that will leave behind something that will outlive us if we have hearts and hands and calendars that are free enough to say yes. So I wondered as I read Haggai, what did the people do with this invitation? And they did something that was as miraculous then as it is today. They changed their mind. The text says that all the people aligned and worked on the house of the Lord together. And I'd like to tell you that that meant that they didn't face a ton of resistance and that they lived happily ever after. But they didn't. The second part of Haggai and the second part of the sermon is for those who have been building for long enough to be tired from the work. So Haggai came to speak to the people again, not because they weren't doing the work, but because they did exactly the right thing, but they were disappointed with the results. They built the temple according to the instructions that they were given, but the people who were old enough to remember Solomon's temple, the one who had just been torn down 70 years ago, thought this temple that we're building right now, that we're sacrificing for right now, is nothing compared to the picture that I had in my head. You faced that, haven't you? Maybe not with a temple, but with your life. Some of us were converted to Christianity with a picture of ourselves just living sort of a positive encouraging, family-friendly life, believing in God and having God bless everything we do. And so we have a picture in our heads of a life that feels spiritual. We start down the path of righteousness and we think that every day should be sort of an uninterrupted climb up the mountain of virtue and kindness and wisdom and hopefully include happiness and health, right? But being Christian doesn't just mean believing in God. It means believing in the God that we've come to know in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And on the surface, that can be kind of a comforting thought and make the gospel kind of a comforting story because Jesus was so caring and really gentle and he went around teaching and preaching and healing and Jesus was a blessing to everybody he met regardless of who they were. And so we can say to ourselves, this is the way God is. He's not mean or legalistic or cruel and judging. Our God is a God who cares and loves and blesses and lifts, lifts others up. But as I've learned by serving in children's ministry for the past couple of years, sooner or later, somebody's going to come up to you and ask, so what happened to Jesus? And then you're going to have to tell the truth, which is that Jesus didn't come to earth and live God's way and accumulate wealth till he floated into heaven. Someday you'll have to look the person who asks you that in the eyes and you'll have to tell them that Jesus did everything right and was therefore sentenced to die. A lot of people walk away from Christianity at this point and sort of take a sampling of Christianity off of the religious buffet and add it to other decent spiritual teachings and self-improvement workshops and go on to have a good family and good relationships, be wealthy and successful, keep it for themselves and assume that this is what it means to live the blessed life. Which is a shame, not because Christians should be infatuated with suffering. Jesus certainly wasn't but because it leaves out how much of God's grace flows into our lives through moments that we would never choose. 
If you live long enough, and who am I kidding? I think most of you already have. You'll come to a point where the pain of your life is beyond what you can bear. And what you need in that moment isn't like a positive, encouraging faith. What you need to know is that you're still in the game. That sometimes God's presence will lead you toward prosperity and plenty and God will guide you out of suffering. And other times, as Jesus knows, the presence of God will be with you in things that are more painful than you would ever choose. And you're still exactly where God's called you. Those are the people that Haggai's talking to. People who are giving God their all and who've done everything they know to realign their lives around the will of God and found that the results are just ordinary. And if I'm building my life around the calling of God, a lot of these people thought the least God could do is to make it feel significant. You know, I want to know I'm winning here. And when you hit that point, what you need isn't really a slogan from a bumper sticker. What you need is to know that God is with you. So church, hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Haggai, starting in chapter 2, verse 3, which harmonizes, I think, so well with the life of Jesus. The Lord said to Haggai, ask the remnant of the people, who of you left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, all you people of the land, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I'll once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all nations and what's desired by all nations will come and I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. Church, whether we're talking about a temple or we're talking about your life, the point was never to build something impressive. The point was to build something God can use. That may be a word needed for some of us who have been building a faithful life for as long as we can remember and find ourselves looking at it and saying, is this it? God is able to take whatever you'll give, an hour of service that you have to drag yourself out of bed for, an honest confession to another person when you're not sure how they'll receive it, a mentoring relationship that you keep showing up to, even if you don't know if it's making any difference, an hour serving in Splash to help Kids know that God loves them even when you're reluctant to sign up. God is capable of taking those things and somehow in ways we cannot see, multiplying their effects so that what you build with your life, even if when you look at it, seems ordinary, ends up outliving your life and outlasting you and contributing to wholeness in ways that you presently don't see, from fishes and loaves to spit and mud to your life and my life, God can do a lot with what seems like not enough. Thanks be to God. You've probably all already caught this, but Haggai in this sermon are addressed to two different groups of people. The first is those God's calling to rebuild. There are some of us who have, in the midst of sincere religious devotion, neglected God's priorities because it didn't feel like it was the time yet. We're standing smack dab in the gap between the habits that we have and the life that God's called us to, and we're waiting till someday it's easier to close that gap. The word of the Lord for you is that God is with you. In Haggai 1, before the first chapter of Haggai, in other words, before the people who have ever started building when they're neck deep in neglect of the things that God's asked them to do, God says to them in verse 13, I am with you and I will stir up the spirit of the people. If you need to rebuild, that's the word of the Lord for you.
God's spirit will stir up your spirit and help you move beyond conviction into genuine repentance. It may be costly to your reputation or to your time or your money or your freedoms, but it's the only way to live a truly loving life and God won't leave you alone until he gets you to do it. So today's the day to stop being sorry and to turn toward being made new. And because God is with you, it really is possible. The second group of people that Haggai and the sermon are addressed to is for those who feel weary in the work of God. If Haggai's audience or Jesus' life is any indication, we can be confident that in some seasons, spiritual life just won't feel all that spiritual. It's just one brick on top of another, one act of, of obedience stacking on the next. And so the word of the Lord for you is from Haggai chapter 2. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I'm with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Church, if you're weary in the midst of the work of God, God is with you. In the midst of discouragement, when the faithfulness that you're practicing has results that look nothing like the picture in your head when the will of God in your life doesn't lead around pain or unpleasantness, but through it. When the presence of God is just with you and faithfulness feels like stacking one act of obedience on another, even there, God's with you and God's calling you to stay in the game and watch what he'll do with the little bit you feel you have to give. Thanks be to God. Well, we've talked this morning a good amount about building, and every building needs a plan. Temples don't build themselves, and neither do good lives. And so as we close this morning, I want us to spend just a couple moments walking with the Spirit through an honest assessment of our life. And so I'd like us to consider a few questions together that'll help us close the gap between the life that God's called us to and the life that we're living. The first question is, which season am I in? Some of us need to start building. Others of us are weary from discouragement. Others of us are somewhere in between. The second question is, what's God calling me toward? For some of us, that's the move from conviction to repentance. There are things that the Spirit has been settled on your conscience about for a long time that you just keep putting off. And today could be the day where you move from conviction to repentance and say, God, I'm finally going to do it. For others of us, it's simply naming the things in our life that God's doing, even if they feel like not enough. For others of us still, it's being honest that we're feeling angry toward God for not delivering us the life that we pictured. Whatever it is, what's God calling you toward today? The third question is, whose help will I need to say yes to that call? The fact is, um, most of us, if we could build it alone, would already have done it. And so I want us to think today about one person will text or call or email before we leave here today. Maybe a counselor or a dear friend or someone you need to make amends with. Think of who you might need to help you say yes to this call. The last question is, what's the first step towards saying yes to that call? For Haggai and his crew, it was getting materials, but for you, it may be confessing a sin or setting aside some money in your budget or reaching out to your neighbors or scheduling a meal to celebrate what God's done in this season of your life. But whatever it is, think this morning about what might be the very first step. Holy Spirit, uh, we're aware that as we attend to your Spirit's leading in building our life, we're undergoing a project that we can't do alone. And fortunately, we don't want to do it alone. And so in these moments of pause and reflection, by your spirit, lead us to become the kind of people who build well, precisely because we build in the image of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Would you stand and let's respond together to a God who is with us. Our service is over, but our work has just begun. And so as we're sent from this place by the power of the Spirit, remember Jesus' promise that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You are sent.